Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today, and this is a special hangout. We have one of our satellite BGAN units in the field in Colombia. Uh, we're connecting with uh, Brianna Rowe and Pete Rowe, who are on an expedition documenting the Cano Cristales River deep in the jungle of Colombia. So I'm not going to say much more. This is an Explorers Club uh, expedition, flag expedition. And we weren't sure if it, we were going to be able to pull it off, but we've got the signal and we're good to go. So, Brianna, how you doing? Hi, Joe. Thanks so much. Welcome, guys. We're in the middle of Colombia's jungle here at Kenyo Cristal. And this, as you can see, is a river that turns red. And the reason it turns red is because there is a plant that grows here that doesn't grow anywhere else in the world. It's called Macarena. And it's a red plant that very unique to this area and look at the views here of this red river so i'm on an expedition right now with my dad who's an explorer and he's a filmmaker and photographer and he's been exploring adventurous spots all over the world his entire life and he's creating a book called red planet so he's now he's gone all over the world to find different red parts of the world and this site was a really important one for us to get to it was really important for the red planet because take a look, it's a completely red river. Now, the way we got here was incredibly difficult. I'm from New York City, my dad's from Toronto. We flew down to Bogota, which is the big city in Colombia. Now it is just as big as New York City. There's a lot of people there, lots of buildings, traffic, roads. But from there, we took a tiny propeller plane, only 19 people could, could be in this small plane, crossed across the jungle down into the Amazon to visit a small town. And from there, we took a little boat up the river. From the boat, we took a four by four down in through the jungle. And then we've been hiking all morning. We started hiking around nine o'clock in the morning. And so here we are deep into the jungle um, and I'm here with my dad and our guide, and we're so excited to have all of you guys here with us. All right, well, Brianna, you have no idea how excited we are. We were a little nervous, the technology, maybe the weather wasn't going to cooperate, but it looks like you've got a nice sunny day today. Yeah, and it's been raining, it's been pouring around here, even though it's the dry season, or it's about to be the dry season. In Colombia, there's the wet season. Uh, which lasts sort of our spring and our summer, and then the dry season, which starts in December and goes until about May. And the only way you can see this red uh, plant is during the wet season when it rains a lot. Um, during the dry season, the plant is reproducing and it, it becomes white and the river dries up a bit. But uh, it's been incredibly wet here, even though we're almost in the dry season. There's been a lot of climate change that has impacted this area and they've seen, you know, there was a dry spell in August, which was pretty rare for this area. And now it's really wet and raining. We lucked out, it's a beautiful day in the sun, um, but the, the climate has been changing around this area and people are noticing it. All right, and I know in the introduction, uh, you mentioned that as well as being down there for uh, the book, The Red Planet, that you were also taking a look to see how climate change might be affecting the river. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure, definitely. So that's what I study is I look at how humans impact the environment and how they interact with the environment. And so I studied elephants in Thailand and East Africa, and I studied um, climate change in the Arctic this summer. And so I'm down here looking at what are the social, political, and economic factors that are impacting this region. So sociology, that's sort of like, how are people interacting together and what are the cultural norms and the beliefs around the environment that impact how we preserve it? And in Colombia, so far, I've found that people really value the environment. It's very important for uh, the for, for people's jobs and it's it's a big part of the culture there and so we're in a national park right now and I have these two bracelets on and so the government requires that every person who comes into the Red River watches a video 
on the ecological importance of this area so that you gain respect for it and that you make sure not to leave your garbage or not to trample anything and definitely not to disrupt this beautiful plant in the river. So once you get, once you watch the video, you'll get one of these two bracelets and that will allow you into the park. If you don't have the bracelet, you are not allowed to see the Red River. So you have to, there's a lot of rules to make sure that people are aware of the ecological significance of this area. Uh, the second bracelet is just a, it, it says that we've paid money and that we're allowed to go into the different areas here. And so in order to preserve this area, you need to have a lot of people, especially people from the government taking care of it. So they, they produce uh, park fees uh, and they get a lot of revenue from that. And that goes into the conservation of the park. Um, and so I've asked a lot of people here about the climate change and how it's impacting this area. And the biggest, biggest threat for the Red River right now is actually oil. They've found oil being produced or they found oil near the river. And there is an oil company that set up shop close by um, that is interested in extracting oil from the soil here. Now, if they do that, the entire area will be destroyed. Now, probably you don't even, you might realize it, but everything in your classroom is made of oil in some way or another. Even the apple you had for lunch today was on a truck and it was kept in a supermarket and all of those things required oil for it to be used. So humans have a big demand for oil. Now we don't have to, we can, we can find other resources. We can use solar energy, we can use wind energy, we can use hydro energy and other forms of renewable energy um, so that we don't have to keep looking for oil. Because if, we, if the company gets its permit and is allowed to drill, this river will be completely destroyed. So that's the biggest threat to the Red River is oil. All right. And Brianna, how far are you from, say, the nearest city right now? The nearest city? Well, we've been hiking since this morning, since about nine. Um, and then we took a boat from there. So we were in a town called La Macarena. And it is a town where, um, where planes can come into but it's still a really small town. There's about 15 hotels, little small hotels. We're staying in one of them. Um, and the, they have little shops there as well, motorbikes for people to get around. There's a lot of dogs, a ton of stray dogs that roam around and uh, look, for your, look for your food. So um, it's a pretty big town. There's a high school there and an elementary school. And so that's probably, that's not too far from here. It's about a half an hour boat ride a uh, half an hour truck ride and then a couple hours in the in the forest here. So it is we are pretty remote. I'm surprised that we were able to get internet here. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, well, let's uh, take another quick little view of the river. But while you do that, I just want to ask you about being on expedition uh, with your dad. I know you've been able to go on several um, journeys in the past and in fact this is your third journey carrying the flag of the Explorers Club. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah definitely. So me and my dad have been exploring since I was in high school and um, I've gone on a few different shoots with him. We'll bring him in the shot here. We've gone volcano trekking in Indonesia and we've gone to volcanoes in Guatemala. We've gone in a submarine together um, in a place called Curacao. We went 650 feet below the ocean surface in Curacao to discover some new fish species. Um, and then we were looking at lionfish, which is a uh, invasive species throughout the Bahamas that's really destroying the Caribbean. Um, so the lionfish expedition was, I think, our last flag expedition. And this is our next flag expedition. And so we're both part of this club called the Explorers Club. And all of the members who are explorers around the world can apply to take a flag um, on their expedition. So the flag that we've got has been on 19 different expeditions. Um, do you want to get it, Dad? He's going to get it for us. 
So this flag has been to the Arctic. It's been um, underwater. It's been, um, where else has it been? To Borneo. So it's been all around the world and we are really lucky to take this flag on our expedition and to continue the story and the legacy of this flag discovering new parts of the world and communicating the importance of the environment in these new areas that we discover. So this is what the flag looks like. Yeah, you can see it. And um, yeah, it's been patched up because it gets pretty destroyed on these trips, but we try to keep it in uh, pristine uh, conditions here. But you know, sometimes it, it gets pouring rain outside or uh, it gets torn off because you're, you're hiking through the jungle or packing up all of your different gear. Um, and my dad's been on how many expeditions? 40 or 50 different expeditions. He does a TV series called Angry Planet where he goes around the world and films all the cool stuff there. So I'm really lucky to have, to have gone with him and we're excited to, to go on this next expedition here. All right, well, Brianna, we've got a great group of classrooms from different spots in North America joining us today. Are you ready for some questions? Yeah, sorry I'm late, guys. I'm excited to hear your questions. That's okay, we're just, we're just glad it worked out. Are you, uh, are you using the BGAN right now? I am, yeah. It was a little tricky to find a connection here, but um, once we got a strong one, we're, we were good. Perfect. All right, well, let's meet a classroom. So let's start off um, with Mrs. James, grade five. They're joining us from Kalispell in Montana uh, in the U.S. So let me turn on their microphone. How's everyone doing? Yay. All right, does anyone have a question? How old is the Cristales River? How old is the Cristales River? That's a good question. Do you guys know how old the Cristales River is? Yeah, so the issue, it's been around longer than we really know how long it's been around. There are some of the oldest rocks in the world here and the way that this plant grows is it attaches itself to the rock so it has really strong roots and a strong stem that attaches itself to the rock these rocks are millions of years old they've been dated back as some of the earth's oldest rocks so i expect that this region has been around for a long time but we haven't really seen it because there has been a lot of conflict in this region of colombia there is a, a rebel group that um, gained sort of momentum in the late 1960s, and they're called the FARC, and they're Colombia's rebel group. So there was a civil war in between the current government of Colombia and the, and the rebel group. So it was very dangerous for tourists to explore this area. There was a lot of warnings saying that uh, tourists should not come into this area because the rebels owned this land. And there was a peace agreement signed just last year, which has changed the course of Colombia's history. And so now that there's peace in the region, we can have more tourists coming on in and uh, spending their money and exploring the beautiful land. And uh, there's less of a threat because the civil war is over. All right, great question. We're gonna visit Mrs. Mark's class now. <laughs> They're joining us, um, let's see, whoops, there they are, from Colmex in British Columbia, Canada, uh, and it looks like they're grade six, seven, so your microphone is on, go ahead with the question. Grade three and four. Grade three and four, that's not what I have on my list, but that's okay. Go ahead with your question. Um, how long did it Sorry guys, can you try that again? We heard a little bit of it, but then it, it faded out on us. All 
All right, we're going to come back to you guys uh, for the next question. Come right up nice and close to the microphone to make sure we can get the question. But for now, we'll go to Mrs. Hunter's class. Uh, they're, they're joining us um, from Barrie, Ontario, in Canada. Uh, your microphone's on. <laughs> okay, um, how do you become an explorer and earn income to live? So how do you become an explorer and what was the second part? And like still earn income to live. Like how do you Ah, okay. Uh, so Brianna, this, ah. this is a question. How do you become an explorer and still have income? <laughs> that is a fantastic question. So right now I work for a company called... Uh, I work for a nonprofit organization called Reach the World. And so that's what I do from nine to six every day in New York City. But there are so many different grants available, especially for young people to get out and explore. And so when I was in high school, I applied to get on a program where I was researching marine biology in uh, Bermuda. And there are a ton of grants out there for young people to get out and explore, especially if you look at scientific research grants. Uh, when I was in college, I then went on to apply for a program called the Canadian Field Studies in Africa program. And so I spent six months, an entire semester down in East Africa. Um, so research is really the way to uh, to explore new areas and get funded. There's a lot of funding out there, um, but you have to, it's different than, than getting paid to do a job. You have to apply to get on the program and you apply to get a grant and then you get the funding to be able to go out there and do that. You could also take up a profession like my dad's and become a filmmaker or a photographer and it's the same thing. You get on assignment to different areas. Journalists also, um, sometimes get to go out and explore new regions. Um, but research is really the, the best route and the best route to keep doing that is to keep doing well in school. All right, excellent question and a great answer, uh, Brianna. There really is, um, if you look around and you work hard in school especially, you can really have a good chance at uh, getting some grants uh, to do research in some really cool spots around the world. So Mrs. Mark Screw, I think you're right up at the camera again, so let's try the question again this time. What type of fish did you, um, what, what type of new fish did you discover? Oh, okay. So he's wondering about um, any new species or fish in the river. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in the submarine or in the river, I'm guessing in the submarine, was it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Sounds like the submarine. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, so first of all, there's no fish here. There's only little tiny, tiny fish and there's not enough nutrients and food for fish to survive here. But when we were in Curacao, my dad and I um, were on an Explorers Club flag expedition and he was writing an article for the submarine. Uh, and for the, the group that built the submarine. So he was on assignment and I was lucky enough to get to go as well. And so we were just there for a weekend, um, but there were people who lived in Curacao, which is a small island in the Caribbean, and they're from all over the world. And they came in to do research there. So that's how they're exploring. And they would be able to answer that question better than you, because I don't know what we found, but I do know how we did it. And that was really cool. We got into a submarine at the surface and then went all the way down to the, I think it was 650 feet below. And once we were down there, there were these little guns on the side of the submarine that would squirt, squirt anesthesia and the, the fish would start floating. And then we would take a, another arm which had a, a vacuum on it and it would suck up the fish that was kind of loopy and, and anesthetized. And then it would put it into a container on the side of the submarine. And because the pressure is so different at 650 feet below the ocean surface, we would bring the fish up little by little. And the, the researchers who were there permanently would go down at different periods and they would be decompressing the fish. So they would need to bring them up at different levels 
And then they had a, a big lab where they kept all these different fish and they studied them and they learned about new species that are found deep in the ocean, which is a place that we've never really had the opportunity to explore until we've really discovered these submarines and built them. All right, so we're gonna join a uh, group with uh, Mrs. Mesk in Brooklyn, New York. They're grade sixes and your colleague uh, from Reach the World, Colin, is there. So let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing in Brooklyn? Good. Good. So, Raymond, right. go up and ask your question, Raymond. When is, when is the red coming out? Nice and close. Try that again. When is the Red Planet movie coming out? Did you catch that, Brianna? He's wondering when uh, the Red Planet's going to come out. When is the Red Planet coming out? Well, this is a project that my dad has been working on for the past 10 years. So when you get to do your own personal projects, like my dad, he works for himself. So he's on his own timeline. He wants it to be perfect. And so he wants to see every red site in the world. And this is the second last one. Actually, no, there's two more. He's got to go to China to check out these rainbow mountains. And he wants to go to Namibia, where the desert is so red there that it's spectacular. And so he's been to volcanoes in Italy, and I went with him once in Italy and Hawaii, and he's been to see the beautiful colors of the leaves changing in Canada, so that's a big one. Uh, went to Utah to check out the canyons there. Um, and what were some other ones that he did? So to answer your question, we've got two more really important sites to go to, and he's got to raise the money to be able to do that. And then once that's ready to go, we'll um, maybe we'll post a link to it on this Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube channel once it's ready. But I would say at least another year. All right. Well, let's meet Hi, our Colin. next group. I'm sure you're jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he is. It's it's a little bit cold here. I'm sure it's a little warmer for you uh, where you are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sweating. <laughs> All right. So this I'm is sweating. cool. Mr. Mr. Whitehead's class is joining us. They are in Welland, Ontario. And many of his students stayed in uh, from lunch to hang out uh, with us. So if you guys have a question, now's your chance. What is the coolest animal you saw on your hike today, and what did you pack? You hear that? Yeah, okay. so yeah. Brianna, he's asking about wildlife. Did you see anything cool on your hike today? And maybe just a little bit about okay. what you packed. Okay. Well, Colombia has the most amount of uh, birds in the world. So it's the most biodiverse area for birds. And so we saw some really cool birds and moths that were neon colored. And I'm from, I grew up in Canada. I live in New York right now. I've never seen neon birds before. So that was really cool. We saw a butterfly that was like purple and orange. And, and so the birds here are amazing. And they make the noises in the jungle that you're used to hearing about, you know, what a jungle might sound like. That's exactly what it sounds like. And uh, why don't I show you what I, what I packed today? It's really important to pack right. So the, if you don't prepare your bag, you're gonna be in trouble. Um, so my first one, my first thing that I bring, water, lots and lots of water, um, because you don't want to get dehydrated. Earlier today, my dad was feeling a little dizzy, and um, he just needed to drink some water. Now, another thing I definitely bring in my pack is a towel, because guess what? I've been swimming all morning, going in and out of the pond. So that's great. Um, my big camera, because I'm taking a lot of photos too. So the camera is a big one. Um, and I wanna show you guys my lunch. Now my guide gave me my lunch today and it looks like this. And so I figured I'd wait to open it till I was with you guys and try to 
see what it is because I've never had a lunch like this before, right? So let's see if we can do this here on the camera. Um, can you guys see my lunch here? Now if we open it. Yep. Inside this. I, I know that this is a banana leaf. And so somebody else packed my lunch for me today. Classic traditional Colombian food. Okay, so it looks like we've got plantain there, a potato, chicken, and rice, all wrapped up in a banana leaf. And so they don't want you using plastic here. They want you to use just things that are biodegradable. So my lunch is completely biodegradable and very traditionally Colombian. I'm excited for the plantain. We never get that where I'm from. Very cool. You're making us hungry over here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. Let's meet our I'm next class. Go. Let's meet our next classroom. So they're with Mrs. Graves. Um, they're joining us uh, from Lord... Uh, Baden Powell School, grade four, five students joining us from uh, Coquitlam, in Canada. So your microphone's on. If you guys have a question, go ahead. Um, what are the natural resources near the river? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I want to talk about the the environment of this region because it's really uh, unique. This area, they call this a microclimate because it has both the jungle tropical climate and the resources that you would find there, like tropical fruits and palm trees, coconuts. Um, so it has the tropical environment where it's really wet. And then it also has the Andes. So it has uh, the, the mountainous region. And then it also has what they call the Eastern Plains and that's a really dry desert climate as well. So with these three climates mixing together, that's where you get all of these unique resources like this plant in this river. So they say that the reason it only grows here is because this region is a microclimate. And here you'll find a lot of animals, like there's eight different species of monkey, um, there's alligators, there's a ton of snakes, there's a lot of different bugs. Um, and there's a lot of different types of trees and um, there's a lot of fresh water too. So that's really important for this region, but it's a really hard area to live in because it is so hot and humid and rainy um, that I don't know how much longer we can even stay out here because it's, it's an incredibly harsh environment to, to live in, but it, it brings about a lot of incredible resources. All right, and we're going to meet our final classroom. Thank you so much for being patient uh, while we met some of our other classrooms. So this time we are going um, a little bit closer to me. We are going to Erin, Ontario uh, in Canada, to Erin Public School, grade 7 classrooms. We have Mrs. Rowe and Mr. Nethery, I believe, are together in a classroom. So uh, let me turn your mic on. How's everyone doing in Erin? All right, if you guys have a question, go ahead. What crops do you grow there? I think I heard what crops are grown there, but can you try one more time? What crops do they grow there? Perfect. So Brianna is asking about crops in uh, Colombia. Yeah, so that's a great question. A lot of my lunch, I don't think grows here. It's definitely not right. But what does grow here is a lot of root vegetables. So oh, have you guys heard of yucca? Yucca is a vegetable that we had and we had a lot of plantains as well. Um, and so those are foods uh, that they grow here. They also grow a lot of coffee. Now coffee is a really big part of Colombians economy uh, because they export um, the Arab Arabaca bean. I think that's how you pronounce it. And it is, um, a bean that produces nice Colombian coffee. You might have heard of Colombian coffee if you go to Starbucks. Um, and it's a really sort of fine type of coffee, really dark and rich. 
Um, and then yesterday I saw some pineapples. So they were growing pineapples in the fields. Um, but a lot of Colombia is no longer uh, is, is producing crops for export, like, like the coffee, which means a lot of the land is actually being used to grow things that are going to be shift, shipped off to another country. And so that impacts what people can eat here and what people can grow here. Um, but you will traditionally find a lot of root vegetables like yucca, like the plantain, uh, really starchy food, um, lots of meat here too. So a lot of uh, the land is used actually to, um, to raise animals because Colombian food, uh, is most dishes have meat in them. So it would be hard to be a vegetarian here because there's a lot of beef, a lot of chicken, um, definitely. All right. Well, Brian, I'm so glad this worked out. I know uh, it was a little tricky getting the signal mm -hmm. to start, but you know, I can't thank you enough for giving us this really exciting view into a part of the world that until recently many people have never been able to visit. Yeah, no, thank you guys all for tuning in. And I'm sorry that I was late there. I'm so glad that you guys could stay, stuck around and could watch everything. And um, I wish you were here with me in the jungle, maybe, maybe one day. So one thing just to think about before we sign out, there's a question came in online from your colleague, Christopher, and he's wondering, um, what could people in the U.S. do uh, to help prevent uh, or protect the fragile ecosystem uh, in Colombia? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. That is a great question because everybody today has used oil in some way or another. Everybody uses energy in some way or another. So every decision that you make about uh, where your garbage is going and how you get your energy and how much energy you're going to use. All of that relates back to things like extracting oil from this river. And it, it, it really is up to individual people to make environmentally friendly choices, um, like recycling, like reusing, like using less energy, like demanding that your energy come from uh, renewable resources. Those are actions that every individual, whether you're at the top of a, the Empire State Building in New York City or you're in a small town, everybody has the power to make environmentally friendly choices. And if we all did that, then we can all work together to protect this, these area in areas like this. All right. Well, Brianna, again, I can't thank you enough for, um, for doing this with us today, for tracking the vegan unit down with you into the jungle. Um, and for sharing a little bit of your passion. I'll take for care of it. Extra, oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, and sharing your passion for exploration, uh, really your family's passion for exploration with, uh, with the students today. So you'll have to thank your dad for us. And I look forward to seeing you guys hopefully at another Explorers yep. Club meeting here in Toronto soon. Yeah, keep exploring, everyone. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, guys. Uh, all right, I'm going to turn the microphones on really quickly. Let the classroom say goodbye and thank you. So, classrooms, nice and loud before we sign off. Goodbye and thank you. Here we go. Bye. All right, well, safe travels. Good luck on the rest of the expedition, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Bye, guys.